Good afternoon. This is my uh, module four presentation on uh, conflict. Uh, we'll be talking about a uh, plane crash that happened in uh, Iran that occurred on January 8th, 2020. And we're going to be talking about a few things here. We're going to be talking about the background of the event. We're going to be talking about localized effects of the conflict, both government and um, and civil responses there. We're going to be talking about what kind of conflict theme this is, a little bit about the geography, and we're going to talk about conflict resolution and uh, we're also going to pose maybe a couple hypotheses about uh, what would be a better way to go about the, um, the event that happened. So the introduction begins, crash of flight of 752 Ukrainian passenger jet was shot down over Tehran, Iran, and in, where 176 innocent passengers and crew died. And uh, it was caused by a military missile attack that brought down the, uh, the passenger plane and from Iran's Revolutionary Guard. And um, overwhelmingly, there's a denial and accountability themes because for three days, Iran military knew they shot down a, a passenger jet of innocent people, but they publicly maintained there was no evidence that uh, they did anything wrong there, any evidence of wrongdoing. And um, they did come out and say that... Um, when they did uh, admit responsibility, it was a mistake and it was human error. So the background, what, what led up to this? Well, five days earlier, a major military figure, major general of the area was killed in your Iraq by U.S. drone strike. So this heightened the uh, military uh, awareness that was going on in the area. And uh, it, was a, it was a very high military uh, figure. And uh, when he died, he was compared to by a martyr by his supporters. He was uh, directed... He was a director in Iraq and the neighboring countries. And uh, when this happened, Iran publicly called for revenge on the United States for the killing of this prominent figure and had already voted to uh, out the United States by the Iran parliament. So let's look at the localized effects of this conflict that's going on um, as it unfolded here. So the focus on the duality of the reactions in the regional area, well, the civil conflict reactions were protests immediately erupted on Saturday when the government admitted it had shot down a... a passenger jet by mistake. So there's this huge immense amount of civil unrest um, in opposition to the government and because the government uh, didn't maintain any, maintain any accountability with what happened and how it was handled. So there's calls of immorality and revenge that was missed directly focused on wrong victims here. Now let's look at the uh, government response to this. The government there in Iran actually detained the British ambassador who was, uh, they arrested him at a university demonstration, a protest demonstration, uh, which constituted a violation of international law. And I put a link down there of the uh, formal British public response the, that was uh, the statement put out by the United uh, Kingdom Foreign Secretary involving that matter there. So let's compare and contrast this. Uh, overall, Iran moved towards less diplomacy and more conflict, escalating the situation with controversy and rash dramatic actions. No accountability until other more powerful states or coalitions became involved and civil unrest became apparent. So the civil con conflict theme, tension and dramatic action displayed in an outwardly acting forceful government, and this led to more protests, more censorship, more government resentment, nations focused on control and dic dictation. Um, lastly, there's a, a geographical theme here. In this case, we see a more impoverished, war-torn militant area that is more familiar with the uh, issue of, of conflict and unrest. So conflict is definitely more likely here. It's relegated to this region more than others. It's an area known for aggression, tension, and civil rights social issues. Uh, because the area is still developing and trying to establish a unified culture and identity. Um, there's an aforementioned link there that provides a uh, introspective um, and resource to the uh, standards. So you can get the idea of the standard of living of that area and poverty in the region. So what type of conflict is this? How does this apply to low-intensity conflict? Well, it's an isolated engagement with deniability and framed as an accident. Um, so the country itself has uh, small limited resources and uh, limited motivated aggression to make a point and re retaliate. So it w definitely wasn't all war here between factions. And let's see here. I would call it more of a skirmish with international reaction from powerful developed states of leadership and moral authority. Uh, civil conflict, as previously discussed as an outgrowth 
Um, but this definitely could lead to a larger war. A good point is that I'd like to bring up is there's a diminished diplomatic image uh, for a country like Iran when they do something like this and they handle it in a certain way. Uh, the world, uh, the other states in the world stage look at them differently. There's damaging diplomatic consequences when Iran is acting more like a, a pariah, not a cooperative entity with the rest of the world. So let's talk about conflict resolution. What could Iran do? Well, they could stop the harassment and aggression of civilians supporting the theme of just war, that theory that we learned before, and the unacceptability of the killing of bystanders, stop harassment of public opinion of protesters through force, cooperate more, exercise more rational decisions of leadership. But the reality of this is uh, it's complicated and disturbed and they compli Iran complicated and disturbed the crash investigation site prior um, to Ukraine and other factions coming in there to, uh, um, to research it. Iran was difficult about allowing investigations until a world organization called the International Aviation Organization gave them no other choice. So Iran was really putting up a fit with this, um, with this conflict here. So conflict resolution internationally. Well, um, Positive liberalism and cooperation in action. Ukraine received important intelligence from the U.S. and the Brit and Great Britain to find out about the disaster. So you had three three states working together to solve this problem. You had a collective effort to find truth and circumstances of the disaster and bring a morally right end to tragedy and to go about justice. Professional investigation and respect for the victims also came into play here. Diplomacy and action in face of conflict. Well, here, let's look at the UK and the US response in relations. The UK had a, made a reserved statement about respecting moral standards and regard for international law, uh, specifically when the ambassador was arrested in retaliation. That, But the US, on the other hand, they made um, inflammatory personal attacks against the government. They made personal statements against leadership in abrasive, threatening, and unfiltered ways. And this was exemplified through critical statements and insulting social media attacks. Ambassador uh, Mike Pompeo's statement is also there as for reference there. So what's a better way to go about the a resolution here? Well, I just want to apply a concept question for critical thinking. What could be done better or worse? Well, maybe a more liberalistic approach where we get a rational, we get more rational decisions and actions of leaders and cooperation. But on a worst case scenario, you get deviations from reality that exercise more themes of elements of power and realism. International responses of leaders through examples of outspoken diploma, uh, diplomacy and rhetoric acting like world police. And uh, all those things. Um, if you don't have cooperation, you don't have a more liberalistic approach, then I believe that it, that just escalates the prob problem and you could lead to, uh, to a much higher form of conflict. So thank you for watching my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it.